so we have so every everybody that's here obviously knows who I am uh, because we're all from the Dayton area or, or in Ohio. But we have Jackie Zykan today. Uh, she's from Brown Foreman. Um, if you don't know Brown Foreman, you could probably get on Facebook right now and see a huge line that happened. But last week, waiting for the birthday bourbon. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, she's joined us tonight, and she's gonna roll us through the whiskey roast series. If you're not familiar with that, she'll be able to tell you about that as well. Um, and at the end, we'll be able to field some questions. And well, let's get started. So Jackie, the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I can only see some of you, but um, hi. And thank you for taking time out to even spend with me to chat through some Olfo. Um, we're going to run through the Whiskey Row series. I'm going to do it in a pretty quick fashion because I do want to leave a lot of time for you guys to be able to actually ask any questions you have or the only thing I can't answer for you is sort of what's next, what's coming up, because, you know, we like to just keep things kind of secret until the press release comes out. But um, other than that, um, take this as an opportunity to ask away and, you know, get all to the nitty gritties of what Old Forester is. So if you're sipping along at home, um, the Whiskey Row series really starts with the 1870 expression. So it's the one with the red strip stamp on it. It's the 90 proof variant that we have. And so that whole series was created to start sharing the history of Old Forester with everyone out there because up until this was released, it was 86 proof, 100 proof, and then birthday bourbon once a year. And that's kind of all we did and single barrels here and there. But um, as far as what's on the shelf, that's what you had. And so when we invested so much into creating this beautiful home place down on Whiskey Row in Louisville, Kentucky, we started trickling out these products year after year to just gain some momentum and attention to the brand so that when we were opening our doors, everyone just already kind of had a taste. And so they go in chronological order. Obviously, 1870 is a very significant year for Old Forester. It was the year that the brand was founded and not just Old Forester, it was the year that really kind of started Brown Foreman. So this is the founding brand of the entire company. And it was started by a gentleman by the name of George Garvin Brown. And he wasn't a distiller. He was a non-distilling producer. He was actually in the medical field. He was a pharmaceutical salesman. And back then in the late 1800s, whiskey was peddled as medicine. Legally, I can't say it's medicine now, right? But this is a different time and place. But also there weren't a whole lot of rules and regulations regarding whiskey at that time. And so it was sort of anything goes, very wild, wild west, just as long as it was brown and kind of had a bite to it, you would call it whiskey and, you know, that was enough. But you didn't go into a store and grab a bottle off the shelf. You would actually get your prescription for your illness or whatever it is, however you got your prescription anyways. And you would take your own vessel to a retailer, to a pharmacy and get it filled up from a barrel. And in this day and age, I know that it sounds like a very sexy idea, like, oh, I just want it straight from the barrel. Yes and no, because you can refill a barrel and you can't really see inside of it. And there was nothing saying that you couldn't add iodine or tobacco spit or anything of that sort in order to actually get you the color, get you that nice little sharp bite at the end. So People were stretching products and of course, cause you know, you're running a business and you're going to see there's an opportunity to make more money on something. A lot of people go that route. And so George is out there, <laughs> excuse me, literally seeing this, like just fall apart before his very eyes. And all the physicians that he's working with are going, our patients are complaining. They're going to get whiskey and it's making them sicker or all of a sudden they're blind and it's never consistent. And so George kind of gets this idea. Okay, well, there's a couple factors here, right? We got to fix the consistency part. And there's also an opportunity to fix the quality part as well. And so his plan to do this was to blend whiskey from three different distilleries. So he sourced from Melwood, Atherton, and Mattingly distilleries, none of which are in operation today, but those were where we started. So it was a three distillery blend and it got sealed in a glass bottle. This is predating glass molds being invented. These were hand-blown glass bottles. It was an expensive endeavor for him to get into, but it was worth it so that he could literally say, no one has tampered with this whiskey. We've made it consistent. We've made our batch. And then we put it in a bottle and we signed it and we stand behind it. And so the 1870 blend follows suit sort of with that process and really pays tribute to what he was doing back then. We blend from three different warehouses. And it's always less than 100 barrels per batch with any of the whiskey rows. Always, always, always. You know, 
we don't use the word small batch or advertise it as small batch because in this industry, there is no standardized definition of what small batch is. It could be two barrels. It could be a thousand barrels. It just depends on how that distillery wants to go with that def definition. So hundred barrels or less, three different warehouses that go in there. We minimally filter it and just something to keep in mind that old forester products are not chill filtered, but we do have quite a bit of leverage in how much carbon treatment we can put on our products. And so with the 1870, you still maintain quite a bit of texture, quite a bit of mouthfeel and a lot of flavor because it's barely gone through any carbon treatment whatsoever. Tiny little batch composed to specifically taste like flagship Old Forester. It's sweet on the front. It's spicy on the back. It's very, very balanced and it's slightly, slightly dry. I'm sorry. I know there's a cat behind me. I hope that's not like going to distract you, but like he's just chilling on a pillow. It's fine. Don't worry about him. I just saw him move and it distracted me. So sorry. <clears throat> so 1870 blend. It's kind of this Goldilocks in the family, if you will. It's it's not too strong. It's not too light. It's just right there in the middle. And it's it's fantastic. If you ever want to introduce somebody to Old Forester, maybe they're new to whiskey or not, I don't know. I, I think it's one of like the, the most quintessential profiles that we make that really showcases the balance of our proprietary yeast and of our mash bill and of just the exquisite work that goes into blending something that is meant to taste the same time and time and time again. So cheers to 1870. If you've got it, cheers, cheers. Take a sip of the doodah, all that fun stuff. So that's where we start, right? We start as a brand that's founded on these very, very great principles, and we still uphold those today. But back then, obviously, it was kind of a different landscape. So enter Bottled and Bond Act. That kind of shook us up as a brand. So if you are in possession of the green strip stamp, Bottled and Bond 1897 Whiskey Row, George wasn't necessarily a fan of the Bottled and Bond Act. And from a personal perspective, because he had already went out to create a product that was going to be quality and that didn't have anything to hide. And if you're the one guy that doesn't go bottled and bond in the industry at that time, people are going to question what you're really doing with your liquid. And so our 90 proof whiskey, which is where he thought it tasted best, had to shift to fit the bottled and bond act requirements. And I'm sure a lot of you, you guys are bourbon nerds. Like, I hope that's not an offensive term, but like, you know, it's fine. I'm a bourbon nerd too. 100 proof in the bottle, at least four years old. You can blend from one distillation season. So that's a six month window. One distillery, one distiller, you bottle it elsewhere, you got to say so. This is all fine and dandy. But back then it was a mark of quality. In modern day, we have a lot more regulations now, but this was kind of the start of making sure that it was brown because it was aged at least four years. It had a nice little warmth to it because it was 100 proof. No one had gotten in and tampered with the barrels. And this was sort of the best way that they had to kind of start fine tuning what was and wasn't kind of a pure expression of bourbon. Um, the Bottled and Bond Act, of course, doesn't just apply to bourbon. It applies to all distilled spirits. You can literally have a Bottled and Bond vodka. It just has to be rested in a neutral container for at least four years. It's, it's weird. Like no one does that. I don't know why you would do it, but it's not just whiskey. But yeah, it's interesting. From that point in 1897, Old Forester has had a 100 proof product available every single day, unrelenting, up until today. I mean, like now we've got multiples, right? We've got the 100 proof signature, we've got single barrel at 100 proof, we've got bottled and bond, we got all kinds of things. So the brand really shifted and kind of just got caught in the current of the industry from that point forward. Now, the flavor difference, though, in the blends between 1870 and 1897. That 1897 is purposely curated to be a little bit more spice driven. We definitely highlight the 18% rye in our mash bowl quite a bit more with the 1897. That black pepper note really pulls through quite a bit. And a lot of dark fruit character starts to come through with that one. But outside of, you know, blending on purpose, according to flavor profile to make it consistent, it all starts out just old Forester. So everything that you guys have in the Whiskey Row series starts out the exact same distillate. All Old Forester starts out the exact same distillate. And the specs on that are as such. We take Old Forester uh, as a mash bill, we're 72% corn, 18 rye and 10 malted barley. We use the Old Forester proprietary yeast strain, which we internally refer to as 1B or 1B78, if you really want to get nerdy about it. 
And then we do a three to five day fermentation. We are solely column still. We come off the still at 140 proof. So we take it off the still a little bit lower than we could legally because we like to hold on to more texture and grain character. It gives us a more dimensional flavor. Um, and then we go into an old Forester custom made barrel made by Brown Foreman since we're the only American whiskey supplier that actually does make its own barrels. And then it ages in heat cycled warehousing. And then we taste it at three and a half years. And at three and a half years, we go, okay, when you grow up, you're going to be 1870. When you grow up, you're going to be 86 proof, or et cetera, et cetera. They kind of get assigned at that point. Um, but the rest of it all really comes down to very fine-tuned blending for flavor profile consistency, because that's what George was all about. He wanted to make sure that time and time again, when you purchase a bottle, it was always going to deliver on the exact same standard of quality and flavor profile. So like I said, we're still doing that today. We, we have more quality checkpoints than any of our other competitors. Um, it's, it's interesting the amount of checkpoints that our whiskey goes through, but it's important. If we lose that core mission that he started this entire company based off of, then what do we have, right? And we're just whiskey. There's shit tons of whiskey out there. Anyone can just have whiskey, but Old Forester is really, it's special that way, right? So if we're following the years, 1910 is the next one, even though we did release it after 1920, but we'll go through it since we're going in order. Um, if you've ever had the chance to come down to Louisville and actually see our facility down on Whiskey Row um, on Main Street, that, that location has sort of gone through hell and back. There's been many fires on that block. It's, it's, I don't want to say it's a cursed block, but there's just been a lot of fires on that block. One was, uh, what was that, 2015 was the last time it caught on fire. That was fun, not really, but in 1910, there also happened to be a fire. And so it was in October of 1910, they were about to bottle Old Forester. So they've got this tank of Old Forester ready to go, right? Back then, Old Forester was bottled in bond. So you've got a tank of 100 proof Old Forester. And there's a fire, everyone has to leave the building. And this tank just kind of sat there. And then when they could finally get back to it, they didn't want to bottle it as Old Forester because it didn't meet the standards they've set for the brand anymore. It didn't have the same flavor profile. It's just been sitting there. So to be cheeky about it, they made these heavily charred barrels and they filled them with this liquid. They waited and waited. And then out came this incredibly dark and very, very complex whiskey that was very, very distinct. So they never sold it as Old Forcer. It was sold as very old fine whiskey. Uh, most of it kind of just went to family and sort of business associates. We have an actual bottle of that product at the distillery for y'all to see if you come down and visit us. Um, I have not tasted it in a formal sense, but I may have turned the bottle upside down until the cork leaked enough for me to get a taste out of it. But you're not allowed to tell anybody that I did that. I'll get in so much trouble. It's like a $50,000 bottle of whiskey. But you would do the same thing. Anyone else would do the same thing, right? I don't blame you for it. So this is actually, it's awesome that for this particular story, this moment that we're sharing with 1910, we follow the exact same specs on that. So we take fully mature old Forester, we batch it and we proof it to 100. And then we take that and put it into a barrel that's been charred for a near full minute. So that's as far as we can go without it kind of losing its function. And we let it sit there for seven to nine months. We batch it back together and then we proof it down to 93. There's no real reason behind 93 other than that's where it tasted best at. So that's what we went with. So that is 1910. It is extremely different from the others because it's the only one that's gone through that secondary barreling. But that flavor profile just goes to a whole new level of complexity. Um, I always joke about it and say it tastes like wild turkey had a baby with Nutella. And it's like this weird like hazelnut chocolatey, but there's a charry note to it kind of construction. Uh, but it is incredibly viscous. It's dimensional. It's you can tell which one is my favorite kid, I guess, is what I'm trying to say at this point, right? But 1910, absolutely amazing, delicious. Yeah, I feel like I should stop and ask for questions, but I'll wait until we get through 1920 and then we'll kind of like chat through that. I know I'm probably talking really, really fast, but I want to leave you guys plenty of time to like shit chat. So um, 1920, I'm sure you all are very familiar, right? I would put money on that most people on this call, like that's their favorite one. And am I wrong about that? I don't know. 
It's the marvelous darling of the family. It's the highest proof we have in the Whiskey Grove series. So it comes in at 115. But the year 1920 obviously was awful for distilled spirits. That is the onset of prohibition. However, Old Forester continued to be sold throughout the entirety of prohibition under Kentucky permit number three. So we're back to that medicinal space, right? You had to have a prescription to get it. And what you got was bottled and bond Old Forester in a cute little box, a little tiny pint. Um, but in 1920, our barrels didn't dump liquid that was as high of a proof as they are today. Right now, if you took a four to six-year-old old forester and emptied it out of the barrel, you'd be coming in in the high, like 130s in your proof range, sometimes creeping up into that hazmat zone, like above 140. But back then, we were actually coming off the still closer to 100. It wasn't as efficient. And so the barrel strength back in 1920 for us was 115 proof. And so that's where that number comes from. This is the least filtered of the entire series. It like somebody literally like leaned over the tank and just said charcoal. That's it. It's like there is barely any carbon treatment to it. And that's an amazing thing because as a high of a proof as it is, it does not drink like it because we've just kept everything in it. And it is so incredibly dimensional and so incredibly balanced for the proof that it is. And one of the most remarkable things about it that we really strive for is to make sure that it's not just good at 115. We also want to make sure that it's good as soon as you add water, ice, throw it in a cocktail, whatever. Sometimes the higher proof spirits can kind of fall apart or the, or the, the finish either just falls off entirely or it wakes up and becomes very unbalanced. It can become very sort of a, like almost like nail polish remover. There's a, there's a weird acetone note that comes through sometimes in other whiskeys, not this one, I promise. But we really went for an approach that we wanted to have a high proof spirit that also would just maintain stability no matter where you took the proof down to, because it's important. Not everyone's going to drink it straight out of the bottle at 115. So um, as far as the higher proof whiskeys on the market go, I think that that's honestly what sets the 1920 apart is that we don't just treat it for the liquid that it is in the bottle. We blend it purposely and make sure it's delivering on every way you could possibly consume it after you open that bottle up. So yeah, a flavor profile on that. I mean, I'm sure y'all have had it at some point. If you have it, it's fantastic. The, your signature brown sugar, it comes across as very dark brown sugar. That's a very go-to Old Forester note that's always there. All of your beautiful fruits that Old Forester delivers on, your orchard fruits, your apples, things of that sort. You start to get a little bit of the dark fruit coming through on there as well. Some of that dried raisin, some of that amazing sort of baked pear comes out of it. And then of course, there's always citrus with Old Fo. Always, always, always. Um, it resonates more orange in the bourbon space, but when you get into Old Forester rye, it pulls more lemon, which is great, but it's always there. But 1920, it just, the finish is there. It's balanced. It's very long lasting, but it doesn't drink hot. And I think that that's, a, that's something that we're really proud of. It's hard to pull off high proof whiskey that doesn't drink hot. So that's Whiskey Row. Okay, cool. Troy, what do you want to talk about now? <laughs> so uh, I got a, I got a, I got two questions, but I'll ask yes, one. Please. We can open it up to the floor. But um, see, traditionally, I just noticed this. I don't know why I never noticed this before, but um, traditionally, very few labels pay homage to that Scottish spelling of whiskey. Mm -hmm. I just noticed that Ulfo does as well. Is there like, what's the reason behind that? Is it the same reason that like, you know, like Makers does it as well to pay homage to the Scottish roots or like, where does that come from? So the Brown family is of Scottish heritage. And so when George went to write up his label, he spelled whiskey the way you spell whiskey, which is without an E. So we've just kept that tradition going. Um, anytime we call out whiskey row though, that is a very specific landmark designation in Louisville, then that is bourbon centric, if you will. So the E is incorporated into that spelling, but old four served straight bourbon whiskey, we don't spell it with an E. I, yeah, you're right about makers. And I think we're, it's very few people that, that continue that on now. So. No, that's cool. I mean, so the Irish, I think it's the Irish that put the E in. Yes. Uh, Good yeah. rule of thumb. If the country of origin has an E in the name of the country, the whiskey spelling for that country has an E. So Canada, Canadian whiskey, no E. 
Ireland, there's an E. So you throw an E in there. Scotland, there's no E. Japan, no E. Um, America, there's an E. So that's how I always remember it. I don't know. And I'm sure that that whole hypothesis that I have about that, somebody is going to prove me wrong on that one day and be like, well, <laughs> this is from here and there's an E. Like, I don't know. That's just an observation that I've made and I've just kind of stuck with it and it served me well. So I mean, I've always liked 1910. So like, I mean, I, and I just noticed it while we were talking because I was looking at your old label compared to the new label. Uh, and I just happened to notice that was spelled a Scottish way. But um, so I do have questions, but I don't want to like hog the floor because that's, you know okay. what I mean? So if anybody has questions, um, if you want to, you can, I think you can raise your hand or just speak up. I would prefer to speak up because we're not kids. <laughs> Jackie, I have one question. Yeah. It's not, it's not whiskey related. Okay. Um, east, east of the Mississippi, what's your favorite hiking? East of the Mississippi. Um, oh, this is a really, really, really hard question because there's so many great ones. Um, if you just post a lot of amazing stuff on Instagram. So. I know, well, I have, I, I'm an outdoor cat. Like I get really antsy if I can't go and just live barefoot for a little bit from time to time. I, I, jokingly refer to myself as a dirt ball in that sense, but like whatever. Um, honestly, I love, I love Maine. I went twice in the past month. I love it so much. And especially this time of year when Kentucky, it, you know, the Midwest is still so hot and you're like, I'm over it. Like it makes you anxious and like mad and like everyone's just like done with the heat flee. Um, so there's this really amazing trail up in Maine. It, if you fly into Bangor, not Portland, it puts you closer to it, but it's the Bold Coast Trail. It's an 11.2 mile loop that kind of goes along the coast. Um, gorgeous. I don't go to Acadia because it's just too many people. And like, that's what I'm trying to avoid. The Bold Coast Trail is the exact same views, the exact same landscape, but none of the people. So that's where I go. I nice. love you people. I love people. I just sometimes, <laughs> you know, we all need a people break. I don't know. So yeah. Do you drink whiskey when you hike? I don't. No. Um, I do other things when I hike, but I don't drink whiskey. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. I don't know. I am a fan of having a peak beer. Um, so I always pack one can of beer in my bag when I do like my high altitude stuff. But um yeah, no, I don't drink whiskey when I hike though. I drink enough on a daily basis. I gotta take a break. So cool. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Jackie, I've got a question. Uh, the 117 series uh, that yeah. has your name on it from last year. Um, I was lucky enough to get a couple bottles last year, and as a 375 milliliter, didn't last very long. Uh, how does uh, this year's version, the Warehouse K, which I'm a big fan of a lot of the K, K Warehouse bottles, mm -hmm. uh, differ from last year's? So the K Warehouse blend is more of a holistic snapshot of an old Forster flavor profile, whereas that High Angel share was very concentrated, very, very concentrated liquid. Um, it is, it's very much flagship, like literally the Warehouse K blend resonates very similar to the flavor profile of the 1920, um, which makes a lot of sense why a lot of people who prefer 1920 resonate well with the single barrels out of K House, but I don't know. I, uh, it was my desperate attempt to give the people what they wanted, but by also being kind of like, you can't judge a warehouse by a single barrel ever, but here let's kind of put them together and make it kind of a representation of some sort. When you do that, you get a better, a better sense of it. Um, K is not my favorite warehouse. My favorite warehouse blend is actually coming up next year. And uh, I can't say what it is, but K is delicious. J warehouse is like, dragon barrel warehouse everything out of J always seems to have this very snarky peppery spice to it but um there's more warehouse blends coming I just can't say what they are but we're not done with 117 for 2021 either so I will say that but I'm not going to say when because I don't want people sleeping on the sidewalk anymore because that is not okay we get the we emails late and like it's a three-hour drive so <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. You, I have a question with uh, yeah. this usually such a family driven business. What drove you to get into the whiskey business? Okay. What makes you ask that question? 
what do you mean? It's such a family driven business. What drove me to get into it? I didn't choose to be here. I ended up here. Um, I just kind of like caught a current and ended up in a really good spot. I guess I, I downplay the amount of hours that I work to do it, but, um, I'm not a Kentuckian, right? I'm from Missouri. And so I don't have that lineage. It's not like, Oh, my grandpa was a distiller and like, whatever, like I am a black sheep in this company, hands down in this industry. Um, and that's fine, whatever. But I have enough uh, integrity to stand up when people are wanting to do something wrong or questionable. And I have enough, uh, I don't know, I have enough masochistic tendencies to speak up in those sorts of meetings. Um, but I think bourbon deserves that. Bourbon is susceptible, just like any other category of spirits, to really falling into the it can all just be marketing greed trap, if you will. And you can cut a lot of corners. And I think it takes people that are willing to go, I know everyone's going to hate me for saying this, but I'm going to say this and we're not going to do it that way. And I think that side of me was what Campbell saw and was like, that's why we're going to put you in place to sort of protect the brand as best you can while you can. So, but no, I, I assure you on a daily basis today, especially it was really intense. I, I am a full blown outsider in the world of khaki corporate conservative companies. So, yeah. No, I, I guess what I, I was more- is, I'm going to get fired every day. I'm like, today's the day I get fired. No, no, you're doing a great job. All the products are great. I mean, I love the old force line. Um, no, I guess what I was implying is, you know, like the nose and all of their, all of that comes from a history of it. And it's just kind of ironic, you know, someone young and bringing different outlooks to the, the game and producing great products, you know, you wonder how you got into it considering yeah. it is such a family oriented and, and kind of tight knit community, if you will. It definitely is. I mean, the job that I had prior to this one, I was a buyer and a beverage director for a multi-concept restaurant group. And so the tastings of things and like having to actually like get through the nitty gritty BS of every sales pitch that you have out there was, was very familiar to me. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, you're born with X amount of taste buds. You either have a bunch or you don't. So there's a gift, but then also just, you have to taste and smell everything. You just do like, that's how you learn. Right. And so my history in the alcohol industry kind of gave me all of that exposure to put me in a place of going, okay, I can apply that to this uh, just as easily. Awesome. Doing a great job. Keep it up. Thank you. So, so maybe like going off of that, like, maybe people don't under, uh, like, maybe some people don't know how you got to be where you're at right now. Like maybe that would justify maybe kind of explaining like where you started at and how you got there. Like, I mean, the detailed yeah. version or the short version, whatever, whatever, however you'd want to cover it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how bored do you guys want to get? Um, I think it's, so... a, I think it's, a, I think it's a great story from, from every time, every time I hear it, I always think in my head, I'm like, I bet you in today's world, like, everybody who likes whiskey is like, man, I wish I could do what Jackie just, what, what Jackie has done, <laughs> but maybe. Well, you know. and so like, that's the thing. I didn't grow up like one day I'm going to be a master taster. Like I didn't know that was a job. Who knew that was a job? Like that wasn't an option that your high school counselor gave you of like, here's where you're going to go to school to go drink whiskey for a living. Like it was no. Um, but I studied chemistry and biology in college with the intention of going the healthcare route. And I did work in a hospital and in a vet hospital as well, as well as bartending my way through college. Um, my time spent in human healthcare made me realize that there's a side of it that was a little bit too commercial, too business oriented for my taste. And I just didn't feel good about it. So I decided instead to focus on patient care to go the pathology route where, you know, I didn't have to talk to anybody and it was just samples of dead people. And like, that sounds like a much better option. So um, I applied for a post-grad opportunity out at the Medical University of South Carolina for pathology. They take three people a year. I worked my ass off for it and I got in and I couldn't go because I had just gotten married and he wasn't done with school in St. Louis yet. So we stayed. And then when his job brought us to Louisville about a year later, um, I didn't know anybody here. I had no reason to be here. And I was kind of lost, honestly, because I'd worked for this thing that like now I wasn't going to use. And what do I do with my hands? So I just got back into bartending to meet people and uh, just get kind of acquainted with Louisville. 
got a job with the Fall City Hospitality Group. And in a matter of weeks, they made me their bar manager. And then when they opened another concept, I overtook that too and just kind of bulldozed my way through it. And um, eventually was just running all of their bar programs and picking up Shaker for Hire gigs on the side. So I did work for Heaven Hill, for Four Roses, for Woodford, for Jack. I was on the opening marketing team for Copper and King's Brandy. I was the St. Germain brand ambassador. I... I think the word hustler gets a really bad rap anymore, but I'm just not a person that sits still. And I'm like, if there's time in the day that I can make more money, I just want to. So is that bad? I don't know. Um, but I built a reputation for myself as being someone that would show up on time and, you know, deliver what needed to be delivered. So um, my name circulated through Brown Foreman, through a bunch of people that I had worked with on other brands and other projects. And they got to a point with Old Forester, they started noticing it growing because it was a very sleepy brand 10 years ago. I mean, Old Forester, what? It was tiny. And they recognized a lot of the movement was happening in the bar scene. Uh, bartenders loved Old Forester because the price point made sense and it was the best bang for your buck you could find. The flavor profile was amazing, especially the 100 proof signature. And they needed somebody that understood the science behind it but also could understand the cocktail application of it and understand the mind of a bartender. And so there I am talking to you people. It's awesome. <laughs> Here we go. But I get asked a lot though, like, well, what should I study in school? What should I do? And it's just like, ah, you know, life puts you exactly where you're going to have to be, whether you know you're going to have to be there or not. It just has a funny way of doing that. And um, so I think the best advice I ever give anybody is just, if you're into something and passionate about something, then just don't worry about the end game. Just enjoy it. And you'll end up there. You'll end up exactly where you're, where you're going to be with it. So, but yeah, or chemical engineering is also very helpful. <laughs> Speaking of school, that's a good one. What about like, what do you think of like programs like Moonshine University and things like that? I think Moonshine does a really great, uh, great job of explaining the process and really has such a great facility for people to learn on a smaller scale. But the category is not, you can't take one setup and go, this is applicable to everybody. Uh, that that doesn't do bourbon justice by any means. The nuances of flavor that you get in bourbon are for the most part out of your control. It's it's completely natural. You do your best to get a good distillate, right? And then the rest is up to the oak. So I think things like that are important. And I'm glad that there's enough enthusiasm around the category that people are willing to spend time and money to learn more and get deeper into it. But I wouldn't ever approach it as like, well, I'll get my... CSS and then I'll go get my bourbon steward, check the box. And then now look, I've earned it. I still on a daily basis learn so much. And it is just something that has to be done over time and constant exposure. The majority of the, the knowledge that I have from Old Forester has literally just been from spending time in a spider infested warehouse with barrels getting to know the habits and getting to know the tendencies of what goes on in what environment. Um, the scientific background helps you digest it a little bit better. And it certainly helps you to convey the process to other people in a way. Um, but I don't think that there's one particular program out there that's gonna be a, a cure-all everything, but I'm glad they exist because they all have a purpose, I suppose. I don't know if I even answered your question. Did I just bullshit my way around your question? I don't know, I'm sorry. No, no, that was, that was good. That made okay. exact sense, <laughs> absolutely. No, Sweet, they didn't notice. Okay, good, all right. <laughs> Anybody else? Are you allowed to Listen? comment on a favorite uh, expression from other distilleries? Sure. Yeah, I'm a human. I have opinions. I have a lot of opinions. Um, but it's interesting, though, my perspective has completely changed because I don't drink whiskey the same way I used to back when I was able to taste everybody else's whiskey all the time. Um, not that I can't now, but like who has who has the time? Like I can't just like drink old Forrester all day and then go like buy every four roses single barrel that comes out. Like It's not going to work that way. Um, I was always a big fan, of course of a lot of the single barrel picks I did for Doc Crows in downtown Louisville. There was this uh, Kentucky spirit pick that was just gnarly and had just like a very intense 
you know, the smell that sticks to your shirt when you sit around a fire and you're like, you love it in the moment, but then afterwards you're like, God, I smell like a bonfire, which is great until it's not. It was like that, but in a bottle, it was very strange. We called it outdoor cat. It was awesome. And I've had some really good, really fun ones from Four Roses as well that really sat in a very, very cool spot. You know, they do Dunnage warehouses, so they're not getting the same impact that we are with like eight tier heat cycle warehousing. So their whiskey to me still, I love it. It's very unique because of their warehousing situation. But if you can find barrels from Four Roses that are from like ground rick on the northern side of the building like they are just this like cherry cordial amazingness so but once you go through defect training and you really start to put sensory notes with things that have gone wrong in the production process it ruins so many brands for you because that's all you can find in it anymore you're like oh I can literally smell the fuel from the semi truck that brought the corn to the distillery. And now I can't drink that anymore. Damn it. Or like their pH was way off or they burnt their grain or all of those notes. It just, you start to think of it differently. And it just, I don't know. This is why I drink tequila when I'm not at work, because then I don't think about that kind of stuff anymore. I don't know. I shouldn't say that. Right. But favorite tequila. <laughs> Well, I will say Aradura is my favorite because yeah. it's a Brown Foreman product and we get a certain amount of allowance to spend a year. So free tequila is my favorite tequila. That's what <laughs> right. I'm going to say. <laughs> Aradura, Aradura is mine too. So I'm a Aradura it's fan. Stuff though. It's what great. about like Añejo, Reposado or Blanco? It depends on the application. Um, so I am not a straight spirit sipper. I'm not a purist. I still abide by the cocktail. So if I'm going with a Paloma, I go Reposado. If I'm going with a Margarita, I go with uh, just anything that hasn't touched anything at all. I want it nice and clean. Tony, Tony, you like the Añejo? I can dig that. I love an Añejo on old fashioned, um, especially if you cut it with Mezcal and you get kind of weird with it. I love that. Yeah. That sounds good right now. Damn it. You guys are making me drink in a good way, I guess. <laughs> Speaking of drinking, how much do you drink in a day? Um, it depends on the day. I think about yesterday and I'm like, hmm, that shouldn't have happened. But uh, I don't know. On a daily basis, I don't, you know, if I have to clear through 93 single barrels, it's very like quick sip, spit, sip, spit, sip, spit kind of stuff. Um, but I am a person, I will fully admit this, I could. I don't know. It's not a flaw. It's just how I am. I drink at the same rate, no matter what I'm drinking. Right. So I have to be careful with that because I'll drink a beer at the same pace as an old fashioned and then end up, you know, with like three old fashions when it would have been one beer in volume equivalent. So, um, but I love beer. I love beer. I don't do the big hoppy IPAs, but I love lots of, I I'm an omnium viber and, uh, I drink, I drink enough. We'll put it that way. I drink enough. How about that? That's my fear. I'm sure you had to this taste a terrible. lot of stuff. Through. If Chris Pointer's still on, he's like, stop, Jackie, stop, stop, stop. No, no, I mean, I'm sure you try a lot of stuff all day long, right? But it's a lot of it, like you yeah. said, spitting a lot of it out, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't really get to feel the hug and all that stuff, but you oh, probably yeah. know, you know, where that's going to hit at anyway, right? Because of the proof-wise yeah, and get all that to the stuff, point right? Where you, it registers differently. It's, yeah, you, yeah, when you go through hundreds of barrels a week, you you start to pick up on which ones are going to have that or not. And then every now and then you find a really good one and you find yourself not spitting it out. And you're like, oh, well, I have yet to take an Uber home from work at the office, but I'm not saying it won't happen one day. So responsibility is important. So what, 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 how hard is it to pick birthday bourbon? It's not um, at all. <laughs> so the process, we only set aside things that have a perfect quality score to go into even being considered for birthday bourbon. So we have a 4.0 scale. Um, anything, I mean, any more old forester, every drop in every bottle that you see on a shelf has been made at the Brown Foreman Distillery in Shively. None of the stuff from old forester distillery is of age yet. So they've been down there making old forester at that plant on that same damn still since 1946, I think is when they started shifting production down there. So nope, 1978 is when they moved it from campus to BFD. So they don't get a lot of like outliers. They've got the process down pat. So, but 3.9 as a quality score 
can't be considered birthday bourbon. It has to be 4.0 across the board. And that is at distillate quality check. That is at a six month maturation check. That is at a 3.5 year maturation check and uh, so on and so forth. So there are small amounts that we can actually choose from. It's just kind of getting down to which of these is gonna make sense once you put them together. That's kind of the, the nuance of birthday bourbon. It's not so much, we always want it to taste like this. We don't, we want it to be different every year. Um, we celebrate that, you know, that's a great thing. It should be, it's a vintage dated bourbon. It should be different, um, but sorry, mail just showed up. It's all good. Um, birthday bourbon is a, is an interesting process. Like I said, because you are literally looking at it from a composite standpoint, as opposed to just barrel by barrel or day by day, it's, um, it's different. And then when we proof it, we taste it from 86 proof, which is the lowest proof we go to in our family up to barrel strength, even though we would never do a barrel strength birthday bourbon, not because I don't know, explaining this to you, anything with a cork on it as an enclosure on a bottle, like the whiskey row has corks too high of a proof. You can actually pop the cork out in transport. So that really limits our proof points that we're able to get up to. So everybody like once the higher the proof, the better the juice or something. I don't know what that mentality is anymore, but um, we are limited by our packaging to a certain extent. So we taste it all the way to barrel strength though, just for fun. So 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 90, 90, all the way up to about 157. Um, and then Chris and I sit there and come up with the two points. It's kind of parabolic. It's interesting. We usually have about two points each where we're like, I like it here, but it expresses this differently here. And we argue it out and then end up with a number. And that's what we proof it at. Just wherever it sings its best song, I guess. So yeah, I don't know. I just went way too into detail about that. Sorry. Well, what happens with the barrels that as they, you, you pick one, right. As it comes out of this, you know, out of the distillate and says, okay, this is going to be birthday. And then it makes past two and then past three, you're like, nope, not quite where it needs to be at. What happens to that? Or does that happen? Um, so it doesn't so happen. Good. Yeah, no. So it doesn't happen necessarily in that, in that time frame. It's at the three and a half year mark where it's like, okay, we're going to start tasting through lots. And this one day's production over here had a perfect score and this one over here had a perfect score. So let's taste a composite of them to kind of see how they get along. And then we'll keep an eye on them and we'll taste them again at six years, at seven, at eight, at nine, whatever, just to kind of like keep track of it. And sometimes that composite either just turns into, um, it's not monotonous by any means, but we want a lot of dimension in that particular expression. And so the ones that don't make it to birthday bourbon, but do make it up in age, we use for our other expressions as blending inserts. So 1920 gets some of them. The 100 proof signature gets quite a few of them. Um, sometimes we just hold on to them here and there. If the barrel by itself is a unicorn of some sort, sometimes it ends up as a president's choice barrel. Uh, they always find a home, but some barrels, some blends and batches don't make it to the birthday bourbon cut, but we definitely have a, a purpose for them. Hey, Jackie, how many people are in on that final selection process? Two. Oh, okay. myself and Chris Morris. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and for those that don't know, Chris Morris is... Oh, Chris Morris is our master distiller. So, and has been for, I want to say he's been in that role for 25 years now. So, I mean, he was there when birthday bourbon first started back in 2002. And um, now, I don't know, now we have to share the, the bench together to sort that out. And uh, we're usually really aligned on it though. I feel like sometimes he leans into the higher proof side and I lean into the lower proof side, but that's just a, our palate differences. Um, but all of that aside, it doesn't matter if I like sweet and he likes spicy, that none of that comes into play here. It's not about that. It's about balance and cohesion in a blend. So you look at it from a different lens. It's less personal. Sweet. So, so we kind of, you kind of touched on like, we were kind of like talking about the 117 earlier. Um, whose idea was that? And obviously it's been successful enough to where like now you have two out, right? So uh, what's your input on that? The 117 series. 
So when we opened the distillery on Main Street, we obviously have a gift shop and we wanted to have something available that you couldn't find anywhere else because people will come in and say, what can I get here? I can't get anywhere. And we just could not all come to agree on what that was. And so as a placeholder, we brought back President's Choice, which was a vintage expression of Old Forester that was discontinued in 1972. But we had a president again. We had Campbell Brown. And um, it just made sense to do it. And we could pull the trigger on it pretty quick. So it took years, literally years and lots of meetings to really figure out what we wanted to do with the distillery only series, which ended up being called the 117 series. The address of the distillery is 117 West Main. So that's where that comes from. But, you know, the sky is the limit with whiskey innovation anymore. And you've got to be very purposeful in where you take that because anyone can be novelty. Anybody can put, you know, fruity pebbles in a barrel. I guess nobody does that, but you know what I'm saying? Like anybody can get weird with it and be like, oh, look, it's different, but is it good? Does it make sense? What's the point of it? I don't know. Um, so really the driving force of this first, you know, to be honest, quite a few first expressions of the 117 series that you'll see are more so um, a simplified and very kind of basic, but not in a bad way, just a fundamental expression of Old Forester. I started recognizing that, you know, the barrels, when they yield different volumes, have completely different levels of oxidation to them. So the flavors develop differently. And I love low yield barrels and had so many saved up in inventory that I couldn't use towards the single barrel program. And the warehouse folks are like, please get these out of the way. Like they're just piles of these barrels, with like nothing in them. Like, don't do it. They're good. Just don't. Jack Daniels did something similar years before we did this. I did not know that they did that, but I'm glad they did because that helped speed up the process. So um, Angel High Angel Share was the first one. And I just think it's it's interesting. It's interesting to look at bourbon through that lens of like, you don't have to do something weird to it, but there's a side of it behind the curtain that I get to see that a lot of people don't. And I just want to be able to share that. And so we went with that. The warehouse gate thing, same thing. We don't do any products that are just out of one warehouse. So let's talk about it and let's let's share the story of heat cycling. I think that's a really important thing to talk about with Ulfo. And um, not saying we won't do, you know, finishes or funky stuff later on, but for now, I just if you're making really good whiskey, I don't think you have to get weird with it in order for it to be a really special bottling. I think it's also important to share some of the more simple elements of it that. You know, the single barrel at barrel strength unfiltered was another one where I'm like, I get to drink, I get to, I get to drink whiskey straight from the barrel. Like literally I can just go in and pop it with a drill and just like, Oh, whatever. Nobody gets to do that unless you're buying a single barrel and you get to taste it from the barrel and blah, blah. But I feel like you should be able to take that home with you because it's a very, very special experience to taste raw whiskey that hasn't been filtered or cut with anything. It's just straight out of the barrel. So things like that, I don't know. I think the old Forester drinker is a person that appreciates good bourbon and it doesn't have to get weird or fancy. It can just be good. And there's ways of expressing different sides of bourbon that are really good that just aren't weird. I don't know. But we went through some weird ideas. I'm not going to lie. I had some weird ideas, but they'll never make it to a bottle at all. No. <sighs> so if, um, if you're not, if you, I don't know if you're seeing the chat or not, but the, uh, Kyle Rawson he has, seen, he yeah. says, what is your favorite craft distillery right now? And two, the thoughts on the secondary market and how it affects the legal market as far as pricing and any other issues it has brought to the legal whiskey market. Okay. So there's a lot there. Yeah. Okay. Let's unpack this. The first answer is really, really easy. There's, I mean, there's so many damn craft distilleries out there. Some of them are sourcing, some are actually making their own. Like, I don't know where you want to put craft distillery. Is it a volume? Like that's what con it's considered craft. I don't know, whatever. Um, my favorite craft distillery, if you're looking at it from a lens of it's not mass produced and corners cut, and they actually put a lot of work into the quality of it, regardless of how much they're making, they really pay attention to every element is Brown Foreman Distillery. And I know that sounds really weird. You think of it as this like behemoth, like giant corporation. We're big, but we literally, they cut more corners in the small guys than they do with us because we have pillars to uphold, quality and consistency, no matter what. Um, 
I taste other people's stuff from time to time. And like, I tasted something last night, actually it's made in Louisville. It's called bro brothers whiskey. And I want to say the age on it was either six months or two years, somewhere in there it was super young, but the stability of that base distillate that they're using was insanely high quality. And I was like, Oh shit, someone's actually doing good stuff out there. This is cool. Um, but yeah, they'll be fine. They'll, they'll get along just fine. Um, the secondary market is something that we, you know, are grateful for, but also can't stand. It is what it is. You know, we, it, I'd be lying if I didn't say we we don't have conversations about it. We talk about it all the time. Um, it doesn't affect our pricing. I think it affects a lot of people's pricing. They're like, oh yeah, well, there's there's room for for these increases. We might as well try to capitalize on it. We don't jack up the price of Old Forester. That's not what the brand is ever intended to do. Anytime we raise the price, it's because our cost of goods raised and we raise the price. Like I know people are like, oh, they raised the price of birthday bourbon again. Like, yeah, but it's also old liquid in a heat cycle warehouse, there's barely anything left of it. And maybe our yields weren't so good. And maybe our glass cost went up and maybe the cork cost went up and maybe the labor, like everything, right? Every price rises. Um, but we definitely don't try to, I guess I capitalize on that. There's always going to be a gap. Always. You're going to sell a hundred dollar bottle of whiskey and someone's going to flip it for 200, 300, 500, a thousand dollars. I don't know. There's always going to be that gap there. If we take that hundred dollar bottle of whiskey and make it five hundred and try to capture that, they're going to flip it for fifteen hundred. Like there's always the gap is always going to move. Um, I just, I just want people to drink it though. You know, I mean, we put a lot of work into making sure what goes in that bottle is good. Like, I get it that it's like its own form of currency now. I understand. You know, Beanie Babies used to be cool, like way back in the day. And now someone's sitting on like a basement full of those things and they're not worth I'm, I'm just saying, drink your If whiskey, somebody's sitting on a me. birthday bourbon right now that's here, let me know. Because when the bubble pops, I'll buy it. But Perfect. definitely not at secondary price. Like whatever the bubble <laughs> was when Beanie Babies popped, I'll take it. Um, did, you see, it. did you see the other question about how um, the toasted barrel mm-hmm. rumor with, hold on, I'm going to scroll up real quick. 1910? Yeah, yeah. Um, so... 1910 is an incredibly heavily charred barrel that secondary barrel is it's different from like a what a woodford double oaked that's a heavily toasted barrel toasting and charring are very different processes we toast all of our barrels because preheating your barrel allows it to get a deeper char with less amount of time if you took a if you ever tried to start a fire with cold wood think it, it's literally the exact same thing. So we preheat it with toasting first and then char it. It gets deeper into it. The regular old forester barrels are charred for about 25 seconds, 22 to 25. We don't use char levels because there's no industry standardized char level menu anywhere. But if you wanted to give it a name, you could call it the alligator number four, just like standard charred bourbon barrel. The 1910 secondary barrel is a full minute for the most part. So it just sits there and burns. Um, and of course, having double exposure to two freshly charred barrels allows us to still be, oh, it's still a bourbon, right? You haven't done anything to it. But also you're getting double down on the oak flavor profile. So all of our barrels are toasted, but that one is charred real, real intensely. So to say it's actually toasted finish, it is toasted, but it's also heavily charred. They're all toasted. So yeah, but I see there's a question about President's Choice. President's Choice was a single barrel product before there were single barrel products available on the market. It wasn't readily available to the public though, and it wasn't necessarily where we wanted to hang our hat. So back in the 50s, 60s, and then it ended in 1972, President's Choice was bottled as a single barrel. It was um, always less than about 115, 110 proof in that zone. It was always about eight to 10 years old. So when we brought it back, we kept the same production specs on it. So it is older single barrel liquid. Um, It is chosen by Campbell Brown. He's still, he actually owes me answers. He's owed me answers since May on next year's President's Choice selections. But I pick out the barrels on the front end and give them to him at different proof points and say, you pick which ones you want. It's the President's Choice. But we make it a very safe choice to choose from, put it that way. but yeah, 
They're not released on a special day like birthday is. They're released whenever we have them ready to go. Um, and they're just there at the distillery only. It's a Kentucky only technically because it's the distillery and then they sprinkle some out into the market. But um, yeah, president's choice, delicious. Not a question, but your episode with bourbon with friends was hilarious. Oh, thank you. The bourbon with friends guys are fun. And the episode that they aired was not the first episode we recorded, but we couldn't use the first episode because we got a little too enthusiastic with the old fashions that day. And I was like, you're not allowed to publish that. So we joke that episode one is actually episode two and so on and so forth. I want to say, never mind. I shouldn't say the amount of old fashions we had on our tab. I'll get in trouble. Um, we do yeah, something similar. We do something similar, similar. Do something similar for like our group. I, I, we do a 51% corn, 49% bullshit thing. And it comes <laughs> out and we just like, we just take a member and we like BS about it. But I've had to shoot. We we're only on our third episode, but like fifth, it's not even an episode. It's just, just a, whatever. But we're on like our fifth shoot of it because Two people I shot it with. We had a little too much while we were drinking, and had to had to come back together and reshoot it again. So that's funny, though. I know what he's talking about, though, because that is funny. <laughs> it happens. I mean, you know, just the nature of the beast. I think that first episode. I should not say this, but I'll say it. There, I'm. I'm not like into cigars. I'll enjoy a cigar, but I was and sometimes will admit that I am still a, a one who smokes when they drink a cigarette smoker for way too long. And so I can't smoke a cigar without treating it like a cigarette. And that's not the way you smoke a cigar. And so, especially if you're in the cups, you know, and I think they gave me a cigar that first episode filming. And I was like, this was really good. And I tried to put it in my purse while it was still lit to take it home with me. And at that point, we were like, we're not going to air this episode. This is not a good thing at all. So we'll re-record it and just pretend like it didn't happen. But yeah, so, so <laughs> again, fired, totally just, fired. Today. You're not going to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So, so, so <laughs> kind of hit that, hit that like hour mark. Um, that last question right there, which is like the old force yeah. of the barrel, barrel select is, all, is that only available as a store pick or does it, the distillery also release it direct? I think some people don't realize that if they, so this kind of goes off that too. Like if they visit the old forest website, they're able to sign up and get notifications and that stuff pops up. To yeah. Their... Yeah. So make sure you sign up on the old forester website for email notifications. I know emails from random companies can be annoying, but that's where we announce when we release stuff through the gift shop stuff like, 117 birthday president's choice um we do do single barrels through the gift shop they're mt mts master taster selection because i was running out of room because i i started numbering them and then just uh, the roman numerals took up too much space so now i name them by their key tasting notes so it'll be like mts orchard fruit or some crap i don't know um sometimes they get weird Sometimes people complain because they're like, it said wild cherry and it didn't taste like, I thought it was a liqueur. And it's like, eh, you bought a bottle of bourbon at a bourbon distillery in a bourbon shop, but that's cool. Um, we do hundred proof and barrel strength picks out of the distillery shop. But as of right now, the bourbon single barrels are only available if you buy the whole thing, as far as like retailers and restaurants and accounts out there. Uh, the rye single barrel is the opposite. You can't get a personalized your own barrel of rye, um, but it is sprinkled out into the market randomly. Um, and I don't know like if it helps or hinders the situation that alongside that we were going to release an everyday single barrel of barrel strength so that you didn't have to buy the whole barrel that we could just like throw it out there in the market you know, Four Roses single barrel is available all the time. And it's a single barrel. Like a lot of people do single barrels. It's available all the time. But, um, but we just, this year with, we had a lot of, as a lot of people did, you know, struggles with COVID and we had to change and pivot a lot of our plans. So not saying it won't ever happen where you could just have them out there. Uh, but it probably won't be soon. Uh, we're still, we're still trying to get a footing and try to figure out what the hell is going on in the middle of a pandemic with a the whiskey industry. So yeah. With did like I even strength. answer that question? No, you, you, you did. So we're, we're, we're kind of like getting to the end here. Uh, I, okay. I don't want to keep you too long. Cause I know you, I know you had a long day. Um, maybe I'll open the floor to one more question. If somebody wants to speak up. 
Well, I've, I've got one on that note since we're talking about single barrels. Jackie, is there any way you can put a good word in for GCBS to <laughs> maybe get one of those tight allocations on the single barrel? I'm making a note right now. GC. How, how that, that question has to come up every single time. <laughs> no, that's the first. That's why I'm writing it down. I don't hear that question all the time. I hear questions about question. a lot of things, but no. Yeah. Um, it's allocated have, until we can, you know, it's not a liquid constraint for the single barrel program. The reason we don't just open the floodgates to it is because we don't have the time on a bottling line to process it. That's our pinch point. And I don't know if I'm even supposed to talk about that or not, but like we bottle a lot of stuff through very small bottling lines and the single barrel is in that same whiskey row bottle. So that all goes on the same line down at the distillery. We have to bottle all the whiskey rows and statesmen and the president's choice and birthday gets bottled there and all that other stuff. And then all the selected personal single barrels. So we're kind of at the mercy of bottling lines, which is strange, right? Install another bottling line. Oh, okay. If anyone has $5 million, they'd like to, and, and staff to work it. I'm all ears, please. I'll volunteer. Right now. <laughs> all right. Perfect. So yeah, I'll put in the labor to bottle our own for sure. Sweet. We, we can, we can put together a team right now. You know? you can keep what you bottle. How about that? Like, let's uh, just I'm in for that. I'm, I'm in. in. We're all I'm in. in. We're all in. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a co-op. It'll be fine. This is too illegal. Hey, so my, my last over. question for the night is, uh, uh, it's really simple. Uh, are the bottles in the gift shop filled with real whiskey? Yes. All of them. We do not have any comp bottles on site at the distillery. So all the bottles that are glued up on that pretty little shelf when you walk in are, yeah, I got to remember yep. that. Might have to strap a mask on and sneak it I in. I mean, no, they're all fake. They're full right. of teeth <laughs> and, and dye and you don't want any of that. Tea and dye. It's terrible for you. No, they're all real. They're all real. And people do try to steal them on a regular basis. It's, a, oh, it's delightful to watch on the security footage later. It really is. Yeah, my wife, my wife this past September or March when we went up there for my birthday, uh, we went into your guys' gift shop and she like saw them and she like walked right up and grabbed it. It was like glued. And the lady was like, these aren't for sale. <laughs> I was like, and it hit me. I was like, I wonder if there's like real booze in there, but um, yeah. So does anybody have anything else to say? Uh, any other questions or I have, I have one okay. more like last one. Jackie, have you found thin crest pizza in Louisville? No, not the way it needs to be. Okay. <laughs> because there's a very specific it's not just the thin crust. It's also that crappy ass processed Provel <laughs> cheese that you got to have on it. And like, I swear, like if I ever stopped working at Brown Foreman, I should probably just open a chain of like crappy thin crust St. Louis style pizza just for my own selfish reasons, because it doesn't exist here. Maybe it doesn't exist because it's horrible. I don't know, but I love it. It's um <laughs> somebody who was it? Like, a very dear friend of mine always describes it as it's the bar mat shot of gas station food. It's literally like just a conglomerate of nothing but crap on a pizza. And it's awesome. It's have you ever, have you ever been up here to Dayton, Ohio? Have I been to Dayton? I don't think I've been to Dayton. I've spent time in Columbus and in Cincinnati, obviously it's pretty close, but we've never really done a lot up there. So Dayton is like the in between. Uh, it's in between Columbus and Cincinnati. We're kind of the, mm -hmm. the redheaded stepchild of both those cities. But um, we, Back. a long time ago, we had Donato. Well, we still have Donato's Pizza, which is a thin crust pizza, which is pretty good for, okay. a, chain, for a chain place. But yeah, I don't know. I hear Marion's rumors that there's baby. a place in Indiana that has it. That's the closest thing to it. But I don't want the, I just need, it's, it's, it's right or it's wrong with the St. Louis style pizza. <laughs> Marion's. If you're ever in Dayton, you got to grab Marion's. That's true. Marion's is. Yes, Marion's is the best. Yeah, yes, Marion's. Absolutely. Pizza. Casano's or die. As well, All right. How do you spell? There's, there's Casano's too. I mean, it's Marion's. M A R I O N S. And my wife's family is from St. Louis as well, and they come back and they always have to get Marion's pizza every time. So. Oh, that's a good sign. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. When I was in the military, my mom would put it inside of a Tupperware thing. And then put like a refresher pack. So when it got to me, I knew we were running on about like eight days old, but I could throw it in the microwave and like just kind of chance it because my stomach was strong back then. It's not anymore, but um, yeah. So anyways, 
Um, if you want to like do a send off or say then or you know whatever whatever you want to say before you leave, I, I you know I don't want to keep you too much longer. No, you guys are fine. I'm, I'm writing Casanos. I said Casada. Sorry, I'm like literally I'm taking notes for my pizza tour of Ohio. Sorry, it's going to be great. No, it's awesome. Um, if you can, no, let I mean, us just, know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, just thank you, I guess. Thank you guys because you took time out of your day to sit here and listen to me ramble and. You got to witness the last day of my employment, I guess, since I'm going to get <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Whatever. It'll be worth it, I guess. I don't know. Whatever. But um, no, I just, you know, keep drinking Should Old Forester. Put, if you like it, that's cool. Thank you. Should we put hashtag fired on all of our social media? Yeah, I mean, you should. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Not fired. Not fired. Well, I, 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 not I appreciate you. I appreciate you having a busy day and like taking the time out to spend it with us today, especially oh. like right in the middle of like Bourbon Heritage Month. I know that's like a huge thing now. Um, you know, hopefully uh, in the future, we can arrange to have you revisit us again when, uh, 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 you know, we've done this before too, or we've done this other times too, but uh, re- you specifically revisit us, uh, especially now that we're like in a COVID world where virtual stuff works really well. So, but I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us and uh, hopefully we didn't embarrass ourselves too much. <laughs> I'm the only one that does that. You guys are fine. No, all good. No worries. No worries. Kyle, really quick. My favorite batch I, is one of the one fiftieth. They're all good, but one's my favorite. Okay. Agreed. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys so, so much. I hope you enjoy your evenings. Go drink responsibly. Yep. You know, if anybody wants to stick around for like a social virtual hour, we can do that too. You know, we're just going to BS and drink whiskey so uh jackie thank you so much i appreciate it and you have a great time and i'll follow follow you you on social media because you don't just do whiskey you also hike yeah a lot is it jackie zykan or what is is it is it just your name nothing weird yep nothing weird just my full name real jackie or any of those things right no no one is trying to create a fake jackie zykan account i assure (laughs) you like (laughs) just that all good thank you guys very much Thank you. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate it, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you.